figure out which end they stick the loop into. You get it wrong, it's just this huge mess. Come on, where's the loop? Come on. It's gotta be here somewhere. I'm gonna have to rewind this whole thing. Where's the loop? Where does it end? Oh my gosh, it doesn't end. It's like a continuous paracord loop. Maybe it's one. Oh, there we go. I forgot something. This stuff really doesn't cut. Uh, this is what I would want on my parachute. I should have grabbed my pocket knife. Come on, there we go. There we go, come on. Scissors maybe, I don't know. Blade slips in there. <laughs> Sundance Film Festival presents. What the heck? That's just... That's not working well. Your trees don't have to master you. Recently, somebody said, this grocery row garden system that you're designing, uh, what are you gonna do when those trees get big and they start to fill in the space? Isn't that gonna destroy your ability to grow the vegetables and the other things that you're growing underneath the trees? Aren't those trees going to become a problem? No, they don't have to become a problem. And today I'm gonna share some tips and tricks for making your trees work for you. Did you know this peach tree right here? A peach tree, if you grew from seed, it could easily get to be 18 feet, 20 feet. But I have seen peaches growing and fruiting quite happily right around six foot. And the tips and methods to get it there are so amazing and so incredible that we're gonna cover them in this video. This method right here of keeping a tree under control is called festooning. You're bending the branches down and making them go sideways rather than going straight up. So look at this. This is crazy. Now this time of year I'm pruning it for the shape that I want and there's going to be some vigorous growth. It's going to want to go up from here but I want it to go sideways. So I'm bending it out and I'm going to select and get these branches to go the way I want them to go, which is right through the center of this four foot wide bed so I can still grow on either side of them. I want this tree to go two dimensional. I have seen a tree that is probably 40 years old, a pear tree that this was done on, and seeing it go straight out sideways like a bench at about this tall so you could sit on it. It goes out sideways about six to eight feet and then goes straight up on either side like a two dimensional tree. Boom, boom, like that. Like the goal posts on an American football field. That's amazing. And you can do that. The tree will grow that way. I've seen it. It is science. If it's going straight up, right, it wants to make leaves. It wants to reach for the sky. This is a young tree. It's like, boom, I'm growing up. I'm gonna be really tall. When you bend it sideways, what happens is certain plant hormones start to accumulate and it says, you know what? I 
think I'm not going for the sky anymore. I want to produce fruit. I learned this from uh, Stefan uh, Subkowiak who did the permaculture orchard video. If you have not watched the permaculture orchard with Stefan Subkowiak, and if you're not subscribed to Stefan on YouTube, you definitely should. He does great videos. Very entertaining. He's a uh, Quebec -y farmer in, up in Quebecistan. And this method here of festooning, bending it sideways, sometimes you don't even have to prune. You just send things sideways and stuff starts to grow out of the middle again. You just keep bending it sideways. I once did this with a mulberry tree where I bent the branches in all different directions, all over the place. And every time I put new branches up, I would just put more wires on them and bend them sideways. And then it with this really weird tree that looked like a, uh, a mop that had been stuck in an electrical outfit, outlet. And it was, it was bearing fruit all along these branches that were going out like this. Every time I tried to go higher, I got a really dominant branch, pull that sucker over, tie it to a cinder block, and, and bend it over. It increases the amount of fruit, and you're fighting that apical dominance. And this tree probably needs that. If you want a fruit tree to stay small, it's important when you put it in the ground to cut it back. So this little cherry tree, last year, I cut this center out and this is the growth. And I will cut them at around knee height or even shorter when I put them in the ground. Boom, take the center right out, let it go. Now ideally, I would prefer this to have three or four to make a vase shape. But in this type of row that I have here, I can easily turn it sideways and make it 2D like I did the other one and run it that way too. So if I had a vase shaped tree, I would just let it go vase shape and then any branches that came too far out of here, I would just lop off. But with this, I'm just gonna twist it a little bit and send them sideways as these grow this year so I can keep it low and along here which will also retard the growth upwards. Don't be afraid. I mean, you'll get a, a tree in a pot, it's six foot tall, cut it down to like this tall. Don't cut below the graft. There's a graft part. You'll see a knot where the good fruit variety was grafted onto a rootstock. Cut above that 16 inches or so, 18 inches. Seriously, I had two different peach trees and I decided to do what the my friend from UF said to do, which was cut it way down on one of them. The other one I left alone, because I thought, look at how tall that is. I don't want to lose all that growth. That poor thing. That seems like you're gonna kill it. But I had to do science and put two in, and the one that I cut grew back very, very vigorously, was super happy, and it bore in a better form, and it gave me better fruit. Open center, sunlight comes in. The auxins of the sideway branches, that's a good thing, instead of everything going straight up. So don't be afraid to just come out and chop it. That's the first thing you do. You put a bare root tree in the ground, cut the center of it out to get the shape you want. You want it to branch and you want usually three or four sideways unless you're training on a wire with two. Sometimes you'll look at a tree and you'll see, you know, maximum height. Maximum height is 50 feet. Maximum height is 60 feet. Maximum height. Oh my goodness. I can't have that tree in my yard. Like it's an inevitable thing but it's not. Down in South Florida, there was a mango orchard planted in my, what is now my in-laws yard. And the mango orchard was probably planted in the 1970s. A nice selection of varieties, beautiful mangoes. But the trees grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And now those trees, this big around, and they're the size of gigantic oaks. And in order to pick those fruit, my father-in-law has to go out there with a great big pole saw and pull them down and then somebody has to try and catch them because a lot of them will fall on the ground and just explode. My wife did not like mangoes for the longest time because those trees in her yard were dropping fruit from really high up and they would splatter on the ground and then they would reek of this sickly sweet rotten mango smell and her job was to mow the lawn and she would go out and mow the lawn and get spattered with rotten mango and she decided she just did not like mangoes and it took her most of her life to get over that. I don't want you to go through that kind of trauma. In Africa, 
where many, many mangoes are grown, where there's a tropical climate, in certain countries, they have discovered that over the years, instead of letting the orchards get really, really huge, like, you know, 40, 50, 60 foot trees, which feel like they're super productive, there are enterprising farmers who are trimming those trees much smaller. So if they have an insect infestation or a fungi issue or pests that steal the mangoes, everything is under control. The trees are not getting any taller than about eight foot. And they'll plant a bunch of small trees in the same space where they used to have one gigantic tree. So you might have eight trees in the space of one. Now, that one tree may still make you a larger yield, but if that yield is falling down on the ground and rotting and you're getting losses to predators and birds and fungi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not getting as many perfect marketable fruits because you can't see them, you can't thin them, you can't take good care of them, those smaller trees are actually working much better to get higher end mango production. And for those of us who have a small backyard, if you are in a tropical climate and you want to put a mango in your yard, you may have just given up your whole backyard. People are like, I don't want to plant a mango. Well, with this backyard orchard culture idea, with this low cutting, regular cutting approach, that you, you own the tree. The tree does not own you. It does not have to become a massive monster that eats your entire yard, and you don't have to can 800 pounds of mangoes once a year inside of one week. It's a fellow down in Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale is my hometown, and his name is Guy. And some years ago, he saved cuttings from a tree which I named the Rachel Mulberry tree. And he planted these cuttings in a lot near his house, where he has kind of a, a little food forest thing going. But those trees wanted to grow straight up and make great big trees. And he wanted to have the fruit. So in order to pick those mulberries and not have the mulberries falling from way up there and then rotting on the ground and being mostly wasted, he chainsawed the trees to the ground. I asked him, I said, how do you do it? How do you keep these trees? Like, they're, they're like these umbrella shapes. Chainsaws them to the ground. He said about every three years, he gets a chainsaw out, cuts them right to the ground. The shoots grow back, they go sideways. He gets lots and lots of mulberries, but the mulberries make this beautiful canopy. And so it's, it's like having a umbrella over your head bearing sweet fruit. Now to do that sort of thing, chainsawing a tree to the ground, is called coppicing. Coppicing is a very, very, very old method of usually producing firewood. It's called coppicing when you cut it all the way to the ground. It's called pollarding when you cut it at a regular height, like people do with crepe myrtles all of the time. So coppicing a tree seems like it would be a little bit risky. If you do that during the height of the growing season, you may have a problem. You may kill that tree. It may get rot and mold and other issues. And some trees won't do it at all. But many trees, if you cut them when they're in full winter dormancy, it actually prolongs the life of the tree. A lot of the sap is down in the roots. The tree is asleep. You cut the entire top of it off. If you've ever cut a tree and had it spring back with six to eight feet of growth in a year, you know the power of coppicing. And getting your timing right on coppicing is important. So before your trees wake up in the spring, pretty close to the time they're going to wake up, but before the sap starts to rise, chainsaw them to the ground for firewood or perhaps to get fruit that fruits where you can reach it. Another method for keeping trees small that I find fascinating is the multi-planting method. These plum trees right here were all planted in the same hole this last spring. You stay there. The last one, this one's looking a little weak. Hopefully it does okay. We'll plant it on this sunny side. This is a golden plum.
hope you live. It'd be sad if I lose one. Not done until... You cut them off. This is an idea I got from Dave Wilson Nurseries. They explain it very wonderfully and put up these fascinating, this fascinating series of videos. I wish you guys would make more videos, but they put up this fascinating series of videos on multi-planted trees. So what happens is the root competition helps dwarf the tree. You get uh, different varieties. You get cross-pollination all in the same space. It's really good for a backyard space. So I planted three plums in here, but you can see one of the plums is really tiny. It's about the height of my knee. They were all bare root when I put them in. That one is not happy. Uh, so it's working. Look at that one's dwarfed. It's perfect. Actually, they're supposed to balance to the same size, and I don't know if that's going to really work. <laughs> we'll see. I, I have the choice of either cutting these two down really small to try and balance it to that one and getting them all the same height, or just giving up on that one and letting these two be the multi-plant. But multi-planting trees is another option for keeping things small because the root competition dwarfs it and then you just prune accordingly to keep the most vigorous trees smaller than the less vigorous trees. I'm so excited about these plums. <laughs> it is going to bloom out any day now and this grocery row garden plum is just going to explode. We might even get plums this year which would be kind of exciting. It actually grew really well. We pruned it way low and it's got this nice vase shape to it and it did excellently the first year. There's lots of biochar in here and lots of life and really good soil and it got lots of water and everything was perfect for it to grow big. And I've already taken these top parts out of it. So it's, it's got the shape I want. Now, plums are supposed to grow here. They grow really well here. There are wild plums that grow here. Plums are easy in this area. But what if you were to grow a tree that was not easy in your area. A tree that needed more care. A few years ago, I wrote a book called Push the Zone, The Good Guide to Growing Tropical Plants Beyond the Tropics. And it wasn't just about tropical plants, it was about a bunch of different methods of pushing the zone, pushing your growing zone. So say you're in zone four, how could you grow a tree that would be more happy in zone six? If you're in zone nine, how could you grow a full-on tropical that can't take the frost at all? What would you do? And it was based on a bunch of exper uh, experiments I did in, in zone eight slash nine. And one of those experiments was a key lime tree. A friend of mine had a key lime tree planted out in his yard. Every year it would freeze to the ground, it would come back from the roots, and it would freeze to the ground again, and it would come back from the roots. It's not suited to the environment, but he really wanted key limes. He was from South Florida, like me. And it's, what are you gonna do? Well. I had read about microclimates and so I took a key lime from a foreclosure. Some friends were getting their house foreclosed on they said just dig these fruit trees up, don't know what we're going to do with them. And they had planted this key lime and they would very, very carefully protect it every year and you know put blankets over it ten times a year or more. I said I'm not going to do that. So I had read about microclimates and I said I'm just going to take this free key lime and do an experiment. So I planted it along the back side of my house, south facing wall, cinder block house. And I planted it about this far from the wall, about three feet. What happened was, is it froze like it normally does, and half of the tree turned brown and burned and looked horrible. And the other half of the tree was perfectly green. It was like you had spray painted one half of the tree brown. It was, it was so bizarre, so I realized, okay, well, my microclimate is from about the three foot to the wall, but the three foot or so of the tree, the ball that was going out that way, frozen off. It could not live there. So, middle of the winter, I dug it up and I planted it six inches from the wall. Now that might freak people out, right? You're gonna put a tree right next to the foundation of your house? Yes, I'm David the Good. I could do whatever I want. I, I, I could just, just make things, just make things happen with my mind. No. It's not, it's not just me. You can do this because you're gonna keep the tree small. You're not gonna let it go and start to grow out and take the whole area over. Plus a key lime tree is kind of wimpy. Like I wouldn't try this with a pecan tree or a jackfruit or something like that. So wimpy tree right next to the wall, pruned back, no big deal. Six inches from the wall. 
Now I knew if it came out more than three feet from the wall, it would freeze. And those branches wanted to go out from the wall. They wanted to spread naturally out to the sunlight and go out like this. So I pruned off the branches that were going out and some of them, which I thought were nice branches, I bent them back and I made a fan shape across the wall. That's called espalier. And espalier is something that you can do if you have spaces. You wanna make fan shaped trees around the edge of your garden. It's this beautiful technique. It's really popularized by the French. And from these amazing gardeners of the past who said, how malleable is this tree? What if we bent it like this? What if in the second year we did this? What if in the third year we did this? And what if we did this? And what if we did this? And they do all these things to it. And the tree actually grows that way. You could see trees that look like this. It'll look like a menorah. You know, multi candlestick going like that spread out sideways or trees that look like a perfect fan or or even there's one variety called a step over where they they actually grow the tree up from the ground and then sideways at about one foot tall and it just bends along the ground like that and i've seen it pears hanging from a tree that is going like this right along the edge of the ground so you step over it into your garden that's bizarre so you could push the zone, you could save space, and you could do really, really, really weird things. But that zone protection of the key lime tree, bending it back like that, allowed me to have key limes for Thanksgiving and Christmas every year for key lime pie. That's when the key limes would come in. That's when my grandma would make key lime pie when we were kids. And so my wife would make key lime pie. And we were the only folks in town that had key lime pie from a key lime growing in our backyard where key limes didn't grow. Small tree, right space microclimate, it works. I find all of this tree training incredibly exciting and useful. And sometimes you'll see this sort of training happen even accidentally. If you've ever just chainsawed a tree down, like I said earlier, and you see all those shoots come back up from the ground, man, look at how fast those grow. Maybe you could use that for your advantage. And another time, I mean, there was a tamarind tree down in the Caribbean that was underneath the power lines and it was repeatedly getting cut by the power company. And tamarinds were normally 40, 50, 60 feet tall, bearing pods way up in the air and the locals would come and knock the pods down with sticks. This tree, the school kids who would sit on that corner could pick the fruit, like right here, because it had been cut over and over and over again and it finally just made a bunch of branches sideways and the center of it was gone and you could reach the pods because cut, 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 cut. They didn't take the whole tree out. They would just cut it every couple of years and make it short again. And the branches that were going sideways were producing tamarind right in picking range. So instead of having a tree that was just a big pain in the neck, really big, huge amount of shade underneath it, that tamarind you could have stuck in the middle of your backyard and still done some gardening around it. It was spread out, it was low, it was controlled. And you can do that with a lot of things. So a few resources for you, pruning and training. This book, Christopher Brickle, David Joyce, What, When, and How to Prune. This, this book is so good. I'm gonna set my other books on the ground so I can show you. This book's got, yeah, ornamentals. I don't care about ornamentals. But you get into the shaping of different trees. And yeah, the ornamental stuff will help you with that. There's lopping, crown reduction, the way to do your cuts, how to prune. Look at this, apricot tree growing sideways. Amazing, okay? This information here, you get it in your head, how it works, and you see the photos of how people do it, and suddenly your, your whole perspective will change and you realize, look at I'm in control. We were made to tend a garden. And the trees really respond to us. They want to grow for us. And you can reshape and change the shape of things that don't look good. You can reinvigorate growth and you can get fruiting where you want it. This book, I highly recommend it. I will put a link below. It will be an affiliate link. So if you want to support this channel and you want this book, get it. I will get a few cents or so on every sale. Now, same thing. Here's another one. This one's all fruit trees. Ann Ralph's Grow a Little Fruit Tree. I can't recommend this book enough. I've recommended it many times. I've helped make it a bestseller again. It keeps showing up now in the Amazon Top 100 Gardening Books, and I think that is fantastic. She is talking about how to use backyard orchard culture to keep fruit trees under control, how it works, some on grafting, multi-planting trees, making a hedge out of edible trees, 12 trees in a hedgerow, 10 foot by 30 foot, 
This stuff is fascinating. I absolutely love it. It's a beautifully designed book, wonderfully written. Her enthusiasm just shines through. If you don't have this book, buy this book. You'll just end up binging on it and reading it and reading it and reading it. I'll put a link to that below too. And then finally, I've got to talk about my little book. This is my manifesto on grocery row gardening. So this is what kind of started this whole discussion today. Can you have your fruit trees inside of a row and grow vegetables under them and will the fruit trees take over? No. So I write a lot about that in here. It's just a little book. It explains how I did these experiments, how the system works, and it invites everybody to come along and experiment with me. And these books help support the channel. So this book, Grocery Row Gardening, little booklet, it's not very expensive. I will put a link to that below too. If you have any interesting ideas on tree pruning or you wanna share any ideas, leave them in the comments below. I love this sort of stuff. I love playing with trees and the long-term shaping and exciting and interesting things you can do. It's, it's like having a box of Legos that you can just make whatever you want to with. You're not limited to the picture that's on the box to the size, to the shape, to the, you don't have to just make spy super such and such boat three with the, the boat that's on the picture of the box. No, you can turn that boat into a spaceship. Just keep that in mind. Trees are malleable. Thanks for joining me. I hope this is inspiring and gets you to realize how much you can actually do, even in a tiny space, with fruit trees. Catch y'all next time. And until then, may your thumbs always be green. Somebody asked me about the grocery row gardening system that I created and they said what about the size of those trees aren't the trees that you're planting in these vegetable gardens going to eventually just take the whole space over today I'm going to share with you why you don't have to worry about all right let's start that over again today I'm going to share why that's not a problem and why you can be in control of your tree, or how you can be in control, son of a gun. It's like it's, it's like it's writing itself in my head, but then it's just, it's just breaking out my mouth. Did you ever wish you could fly and had a pony? <laughs> Many trees have a strong desire for apical dominance. That's, that's like, just totally mastering apicals. And this one is apicaling straight up right now. And when it's apicaling straight up, the hormones are all about leaf production and reaching for the sky. But if we de-apicalize its dominance, stop laughing, this is real. It's going sideways, it's oxinating the branches. And the oxination, <laughs> It's what causes fruits. <laughs> I could just get a tripod. I just like, people don't understand. It's big words. People don't know what it's like to play Scrabble with you. Okay. Is it, is it good? We're still going? Keep going. Okay, so, so. You're gonna laugh! I can't do it if you're gonna laugh! <laughs>